Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads. My name is Marcus. Hey, before we get into the message, you can go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. We'll be in verse 14 today. And also um, in your notes, you have your app. The notes are all in there this morning. So uh, last week we had an awesome experience, Easter Sunday, and just a really great celebration. So appreciate you guys uh, giving it towards the Easter offering. And then also we had, we probably gave, I don't know how many bikes did we give away? A bunch of bikes, tons of bikes we gave to the community here. And then we also pitched in for that tent. So I think about 8700 about right around $8, $9,000 came in because more people are giving in. And so we appreciate that as well. Now we went and asked the folks, say, hey, how much does this tent cost? Because we want to do some stuff with the tent for the summer and uh, stuff. We got movie nights. We got vacation Bible school stuff. We got youth stuff. We got different things that we want to do with it. And so when they got back to us, it was like $48,000 is what they told Kimmy. And so she hung up with the phone. And uh, actually, they called back and they said, we, we made a mistake. Uh, they were thinking it was a structural building, not just a tent with a pole tent. So the, the cost is about $20,000. And so, um, you know, we're just going to keep plugging along. And we're going to negotiate more this week. And so as soon as Natalie gets a hold of those folks, I guarantee you their price will go down a little bit. And so uh, we'll just keep you informed. Like I said before, if we don't raise enough for that, no problems. Your money is back in your wallet or your wife's wallet or wherever it came from. All right. Hey, go with me to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I got a, a message I want to share with you this morning. It actually threw a curveball um, today because we're going to talk about um, something else. And I really have something in my heart. It's not heavy, but it's, it, we need to know this, okay? We need to, we need to understand this. Um, serving God for 37 years plus, you see cycles. You see things in scripture and you see rhythms that come, seasons come and go in our lives, Correct. Amen? We see, we see that. And so, um, have you ever been in a situation when you will walk into a season of life when you as a follower of Jesus, you are a committed follower of Christ, you've served in the local church, and then all of a sudden the serving and you getting involved becomes monotonous and routine. As a matter of fact, it becomes boring. As a matter of fact, you say, you know what, I don't want to live like a Christian anymore. It's boring. Or maybe you don't go that far, but it's just like, okay, you're just like in a, in a routine. I told Mike the other day, I said, Mike, never, never remember to always, never do ministry out of routine. Always do it out of imagination. You want to keep the life in it, okay? As soon as something turns routine, I'll switch it up. Oh, by the way, the seats are this way because we had night of worship uh, this way. So we just kind of left it like that. Is that all right? You're more than welcome to switch if y'all want to, so you don't get a crick in your neck. All right? <laughs> Um, and so you, we've been in situations like that where, where we become, our angels are bored also. And you know, you're never sending angels out. You're never praying according to God's will. And it's just, it just becomes boring. You become lethargic, so to speak. Uh, there's a film, in, in, in film industry terms, it's called visual lethargy. And that's the process of becoming desensitized to the same sight. You know, you, you go through that, it's like you see this, you, you buy a brand new condo, and in the beginning it's like, man, it's awesome. You see everything, it's beautiful. Then after about, you know, a few weeks or so, you just want to get the kids out of there. I mean, you just want, some, you get desensitized to this stuff. Happens in marriage also, but I'm not going to go there. All right? You get desensitized to the same things over and over again. The local church, you get desensitized. But that doesn't mean that there's still a true mission that God has for us as a body of Christ to go and fulfill that mission and go and preach the gospel to the community and surrounding area that we're responsible for, correct? And so we still have to, you know, we have to maintain our, 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 our beauty on the inside. The things that God once left you breath, that once, you know, when, whenever you, either it was scripture or just the joy of God, at one time it left you breathless. When you were thinking about the things of God, now it's become dull. It's when those times when the sacred in Jesus have now become common. It's those times when the rituals that you love to do, like communion, they become religious. They're not spiritual rituals anymore, just religious things. It's those times when the holy becomes hollow. And the involvement that you once had, the energy that you once had, all of a sudden it, um, you become, you go from, from involvement and participator to just a spectator. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. All right, good. I have too. Thank you. I thought I was alone for for a second. <laughs> You've lost your first love. Lost your first love. 
And there's nothing wrong with that because I'm, I'm thankful that scripture addresses this. It addresses this for our admonition, addresses this because if you find yourself in that place in life, it doesn't mean that that's without hope or don't feel condemned because you find yourself in that place now. What I'm gonna show you is how to get out of that place into a place of strength again, okay? Because in Revelations, uh, I think Jesus was addressing the church of Sardis. I'm not sure, but I think it's in Re Revelations 3 or so. He, he said, hey, listen, I see all the works that you've done. It, it seems as though on the outside you're really, really involved and you're really, you know, it looks good on the outside, but inside you're dead. And he says, I know all the works. He goes, but here's one thing I have against you. You lost your first love. And he's, he's trying to admonish them. to so like, hey, get out of that place because there's a whole lot more. I've got so much more for you. And so, so please, you know, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not here to tell you that what you're doing here today to come to church is, is a bad, you know, if you don't feel alive or really, you know, really, really feel awesome about it, that that's a bad thing. No, we just go through this kind of stuff every now and then, correct? And so, but that's, being in that place and staying in that place is not going to be productive for our family or for the kingdom's sake, Amen. And so we have to all be involved. We all have gifts here. We all have different, different things that we can, we can contribute to the overall mission of our mandate here in our community and surrounding area. And we need you. I need you. You need me. We need each other. Because I'm thinking about the cousin that lives right down the road from you and the grandma that stays next door that doesn't know Jesus. I'm thinking about your son that's been running and he's an, he's an addict and no one knows how to, how to reach him. But one of us here might have a connection there. But if we're spiritual lazy or we, we become to that place, we become complacent and we're not out of that place, all of a sudden our, 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 our paths cross, but we're sleeping and the connection doesn't take place. I know that sounds far-fetched, but listen, I'm telling you, every single day is a life of adventure in Jesus. I'm seriously, I mean, it's just like, what's going to happen today, Lord? This is just the craziest thing that's going to happen, right? All of a sudden you go from a church with no tent to a tent. Like, what are we doing with a tent? <laughs> right? And so, so it's, it's a beautiful thing to walk with Christ, but every now and then you'll find yourself in that place. So the title of this morning's message is, it's time to wake up. I've been sensing, like, not only in, not necessarily this body of Christ, because y'all guys are amazing, but I know individuals in this body of Christ who've become, who've gone through that, including myself. This is not a me versus you thing. This is a we thing. And so I find myself in that. And I know many times when, when I'm struggling with something or I'm going through something spiritually, it's, it's, it's to waken me up because the body's going through this. And so I begin to dig into scripture and I know that it's not only for me, but it's also for the body here. And so not only do I sense this one for our body, but it's for the universal church. Because I sense that the church is getting lazy. The COVID thing, all that stuff that happens, it's a plan of the enemy. Let me tell you something. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, he's not going to take away your salvation because once you're in Christ, you're in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things become new, right? You're recreated in Christ Jesus. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is on the inside of us. He can't take that away from us. But the next thing that the enemy tries to do is get you in a place of boredom so that you're not effective. And that's exactly what was taking place in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, when the apostle Paul was addressing the church at Ephesus. I mean, these guys were alive. These guys were doing really good things. They were doing awesome things. And he was telling them, he goes, hey, in Ephesians 5.1, it says, be imitators of God. Do what God would do. Imitate, me, imitate him and walk in love. And he was, he was giving them all the awesome things that uh, God had given to us in Christ in the first few chapters. And then right afterwards, he goes, why are you doing those stupid things that I delivered you out of? Get up from that place. Wake up from that place of affliction. Wake up from that dormant place in life and rise up. Let Christ shine inside of you so we can get back to business here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, so that's the admonition today, but I'm going to show you how to do that here in just a second. Is that all right? Okay. Now here lately, I don't know about you, but have you ever uh, fallen asleep when you were supposed to be awake? Yes. Like in church? <laughs> the preacher's preaching and it's so boring and you're just like passing out. Church is over and you're still in the same seat, dribbling with spit. It reminded me of a, a little Johnny. 
that he went into the men's bathroom one Sunday morning and he noticed that there was a new, uh, what do you call those air, uh, those dryer air things that you, you press the button and all that stuff comes out, right? Instead of those towels. So Johnny thought it was cool, but he thought he'd put a, a, a sticky note on there. And he says, uh, press this button. He puts it on that button. He says, press this button for the next greatest uh, inspirational message from our pastor. I don't know if you guys get that or not. It's just a bunch of hot air, okay? All right. That's not going to happen here. Forget it. Let me move on. Um, but we find ourselves sleeping sometimes when we should be awake. Years ago, well, before COVID deal, I used to go to the movies at night on Sunday nights because it's Sunday night is like what we call a preacher's hangover. And so I would go in to the movie theater at the latest show. Most of the time, it was just me and the theater or me and a handful of folks that were spread out. And I remember uh, I sat there in New Braunfels, I forgot the name of the movie theater, but I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I get a tap on the shoulder. And I'm looking up, it's like, yes. He goes, it was the attendant. He goes, sir, he goes, if you keep snoring, he goes, I'm gonna have to kick you out of this place. I had no clue whatsoever. I was supposed to be focused, you know, and, and paying attention to whatever I was watching. But I just usually, I'd go to the movie theater, take a nap. And, but this time I must have really been tired because I was, I was snoring. And so even my granddaughter said, he goes, Popo, he goes, you're just going to sleep. I was like, that's okay. Just watch the movie. I'm all right. <laughs> but many times we find ourselves sleeping when we should be awake. Well, the same is true, not only in the natural or in the physical, the same is true spiritually. When we should be alive and walking with God and moving forward in the things of God, uh, we find ourselves sleeping spiritually. In the natural, it's called EDS, excessive daytime sleepers. Anybody know friends that are like that? No? Man, really? I do. I call it, in the, in the spiritual, I call it spiritual narcolepsy. And that's exactly how, what we find ourselves in many times. And so the Bible's full of stories of comments and, and, and characters that have done this. And so if I know if it's, if it's in Scripture... Um, I know that it's going to happen in our lives as well. Peter, James, John, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. They, he needed them. He said, man, let's pray. The flesh is, you know, weak. The spirit is willing. And so he goes and prays, and when he comes back, those guys are asleep. And he says, man, can't you just be awake for one hour? Can't you just pray with me for an hour? Happens over and over and over again in Scripture. Proverbs says this, if you sleep during the harvest time, you know, the harvest time is when, man, it, the product's coming out. But if you're asleep during the harvest time, it's a shame. And let me tell you, friends, the harvest time is here right now. I could sit here and make an altar call right now, and people will respond. It happens all the time, wherever we go. It's harvest time. But if we're not aware of that, you know, you're just spiritually seeping. You're not realizing that, man, God is doing a work even now. Why? He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> and we need to be ready. So Paul talks about spiritual apathy like this. It's time for you to wake up out of sleep in Romans, the 13th chapter. For now the salvation is nearer to us than when we first believe. And so today I'm just going to look at uh, a little outline. I'm going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture in in, uh, in uh, Ephesians 5, 14 through 20. And then when I read that this week, a couple of days ago, actually, all of a sudden I got this outline real quick, and I'm going to share that with you, make some comments, then we'll go eat some barbecue. All right? Verse 14. Are you guys good? Man, I need to pray for you. I need to pray. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the life in the Word of God, for the Spirit of God to teach us and guide us into all truth. And Father, we are right now just like baby birds, ready to receive all that you have for us today. We trust you take authority over the enemy that tries to come and cause ears to be deaf and eyes to be blind. I just speak life into this message. Bring to my remembrance anything, any illustration that would reveal truth for your cause in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 14 says it this way, wake up from your sleep, Christ, climb up out of the coffin and Christ will show you the light. It says, use your head, watch your step, make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Isn't that the truth, right? Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure that you understand what the master wants. In other words, he says, understand what the will of the Lord is. And he says this, don't drink too much wine, Danny. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. That cheapens your life. Drink the spirit of God, huge draughts of him. 
Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything. Any excuse for a song to God the Father in the name of our Master, Jesus Christ. Here's the simple outline. What do you do when you become spiritually lazy or spiritually bored in life and you become apathetic to the things of God? Here's what you do. You've got to wake up. You've got to climb out. You've got to drink in. You've got to sing out. Those four things. Let's talk about those things real quick. Number one is what? Wake up, okay? Wake up. Now, before I tell you how to wake up, let me tell you this, that you have an enemy. You have an enemy, and he doesn't like you. But you don't have to be scared of him, because you're a greater, uh, the greater one is on the inside of you. And you can overcome anything. He calls you an overcomer before you even think you're an overcomer, right? And so you're, 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 you're divinely secure in Christ Jesus. But you do have an enemy, and he comes subtly, and he comes to sift you. You know what that means? It's just agitation. He wants to agitate you, get you frustrated, inward agitation. He wants to get you to quit. He wants you to get you to surrender the, right, the, the, the white flag. He wants to shake your faith. It's all about your faith, friends. It's not about producing anything. It's about living in faith. Amen. Will he find faith when he comes back to this earth? Well, will he? The scripture says that a lot of times, well, when Christ comes back, he's going to find many sleeping. And so the enemy comes to sift you like he tried to do Peter. To agitate you and get you into a place of, of misery where you're just like, you're bored. It's like, oh man, this doesn't matter. Christianity, that my parents, eh, it's all blah, blah, blah. He not only tries to sift you, he tries to also seal you. Just like he tried to do Jesus. You know, Jesus is the great Messiah. He's the great promise. He's the great divine one. He's the great anointed one. Now all of a sudden, the enemy thought he had him. He killed him, and he puts him on the cross. He takes him off the cross, throws him in a grave to do what? To seal him. So that no one would ever dream again. No one would ever talk about him again. That's exactly what he does in your life. After tragedy strikes, the dream goes away. The enemy tries to come and throw that dream in a cold, dark cave so you'll never dream again. So you'll never trust again. So never put your faith in God again. Just because something happened in your life and you don't understand it, he's just trying to take you down so that you'll never believe again. Seal you. He tries to sip, sift you, seal you, and then he tries to swallow you. Totally. And that's what the scripture talks about. Swallow you in fear. 1 Peter 5.8 says that you have an enemy. He comes to see seeking whom he may devour. That word devour means swallow. He tries to swallow you whole. So that way you'll, you just surrender. And your allegiance is no longer committed to the master. You put yourself under the submission of another master that he delivered you out of. And that's the cycle. And so the first thing Paul admonishes us to do in six minutes is wake up. Wake up. And the word wake up means to arouse, to rise up, to stir up. Say stir up. That's a great, great passage right there. You know, what do you do whenever you are sleeping more than you want to get up? You know, like whenever you wake up and you're all foggy and, and your husband's telling you, wake up, girl. Or, or he, you're telling him, wake up, son. What do you do whenever you want to, you, you know you're supposed to get up, but you're, you're having a hard time getting up. I don't know about you. I mean, I go wash my face. I slap, oh, wow. I slap myself. I forgot about that. I was going to do it on this side. I did that the other day when, when Natalie and I were from in Re Fredericksburg, we were down there and we we're driving back and I, I don't like to drive, man. Natalie drives for hours. I don't like to drive every 30, 40 minutes. I got to stop because I just, I just start falling asleep. I don't know why. So, um, I'm driving back from Fredericksburg and then all of a sudden Natalie hears that noise and she looks at me and goes, what are you doing? She goes, man, babe, I just got to slap my face. I got to wake up. I got to get up. She goes, Marcus, just pull over. Let me drive. <laughs> it's like, okay, happy birthday. <laughs> But you, got, you, got to, you have the initiative. You have to take the initiative. The control is in your hand. God's not going to come down and slap you around. Well, maybe he will, but that's not how he operates. He goes, you stir yourself up. Amen. He's not saying, hey, pray to God that he would stir you up. No, you're responsible. I'm sorry, brother, if I was yelling. <clears throat> okay. He says, you stir yourself up. And he's what, he, he's, he's what he's saying. In 2 Timothy, uh, in, ver in verse 6 of chapter 1, it says, he's... Timothy is having a hard time pastoring the church because he's, he's struggling because he's, uh, he's being intimidated. There's some hard things going on in the church. And he started getting in fear and he started getting, you know, 
overpowered by all this stuff the enemy was trying to throw in his head. He wanted to quit. But the, the mentor, the coach comes in and he empowers him with these words. He goes, put yourself in remembrance and stir up that gift of God that was given to you when they laid hands on you. Amen. Says, Timothy, get up, put your big boy boots on and get up, rise up from that place, stir yourself up. Amen. And a lot of times, if you find yourself spiritually slacking right now, you got to just turn around your neighbor and just do that to him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't do that to him. Get out of your coma and into your calling. Because that's what happens. You get into a coma. If you had children, you've seen your child in a coma state. Son, come here. Son. Right? Well, husbands, you've seen your wife that way. Probably, probably the other way around, actually. I'm watching the game. They're in a coma. We got to get out of the spiritually. That can happen, my friends. All of a sudden, the messages of God's word that were so alive to you at one time, I mean, the breath of God, you were like, man, that is so good. You hear them and hear them, and then all of a sudden you hear the same ones, but you're, you're thinking about who's Dallas is going to pick. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Oh, me or oh, my, right? So wake up, he's what he says. Number two is what? Climb out. He says, climb out of the coffin. Well, if you're going to climb out of the coffin, that means that somehow or another, you've fallen into the coffin. And so just listen to me real quick. If, you've, if you find yourself in a place of death, in a place of a coffin-like place, anything, what is that? What is, anything that puts you into a dark place, anything that puts you into a grave, anything that makes you dead to people, dead to your spouse, dead to your children, dead to your calling, dead to those things, it makes you inactive, it keeps you isolated, it keeps you in hiding, it keeps you living a life of secrets, anything that drives you into a coffin, into the grave is not good. Right? It keeps you in the coffin of excuses. And if you find yourself that way, good news again is that God has helped you to get you, he's, he's going to help you get out, get out of that place. God will use his word. God will use his spirit. God will use his people. God will use worship. God will use your children. God will use whoever he needs to use because that is not the state he wants you to stay in. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says, though a righteous man will fall, he will rise up. Seven, he falls seven times, he will rise up again. My favorite passage, Psalms 37, it says, the steps of a righteous are ordered of the Lord, right? He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord will uphold them with his righteous right hand. Listen, you friend, so I pray for some of you guys, your, your mom and your dad, they're, they're struggling in different areas in your life, and you feel like they've fallen, they're not going to get back up. But I'm telling you, God is holding them up with his righteous right arm. He'll not let them go. He'll not let them go. I was reminded of a story of um, uh, this little boy who was out in Louisiana, you know, swimming out there with the, uh, in, in the creeks and stuff they have out there. I'm, I'm going to make this up, okay? Because so, I don't remember all the story. <laughs> but he's out there and he's swimming and he, he takes off. He was, he was with his dad in the living room and he takes off. And he goes and jumps into that, that pool or that pond or whatever that is. And dad happens to see him. And as he's seeing his son swimming, he also sees an alligator coming towards him. So the dad runs. He runs out there. ready. He's telling his son, he goes, get out of the pond, get out of that lake. And so all of a sudden the, the boy starts panicking. And he's swimming out. And just when he reaches his son, that alligator reaches his feet and it catches his leg and they were in a tug of war. But the man won. The, he was able to pull his back. The passion that he had to get his, his boy right and, 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 and in a safe place outweighed the strength of an alligator. But he was all scarred. He was all wounded and all bruised. Not only did he have wounds and bruises in his legs, but he had scars and marks on his hands from the, the power of his dad gripping him in, 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 that, in that struggle. The news reporter got a hold of him after months of uh, uh, surgeries and stuff. And they were talking to that little boy. He goes, can I see your scars? And he said, yeah. So he picks up, you know, his legs and they were showing him all the scars. And he was trying to share the story. And the little boy was at him. And he goes, but look at these other scars. These are these other scars. These are the scars. He goes, what are those scars from? He goes, these are the scars of my dad. He goes, because he held on to me. He fought for me. And he never let me go. And I'm telling you, man, that's who your heavenly father is. You might find yourself in a coffin, but he'll fight for you and he'll never let you go. 
And so you might have scars in life and the scars can either, either, either make you think of the bad things in life or the scars. I have a tons of scars on my legs. Dogs bit me, uh, traveling to Israel. I got a little rattlesnake bit me. But those scars, they don't remind me of the pain. You know what it reminds me? Of the grace of God holding me and keeping me. And so you might be here and you're scarred up in life, but I want you to know you're still here. You're here on a Sunday morning. God's grace is still with you. He's getting you out of this place into another place of victory. Amen. Amen. Get, get out of the coffin. Number three, drink in. I don't have to talk a lot about drinking because y'all guys know very well how to do that. <laughs> drink in. It says drink in from the spirit of God. Huge droughts of him. And all, when it comes to your faith, there's an intake and there's an output. When he's talking about drinking in, he's talking about intake. And one of the best ways to drink in is like what we did a night of worship the other night. I'm so glad uh, uh, Abby and Emily, the two Murphy girls, the sons of the daughters of thunder, they, they had a passion to do that. And they did that well. And man, we just basked in God's presence. Just loved God. There wasn't any jumping up and down. There wasn't any loud noises. We're just worshiping the Lord. Just this intake, just the drinking in. And that's how you start getting filled back up. That's how all of a sudden the holiness and the holy things of God become, you know, real, even more real back again. So you got to drink in. Psalm 16, it says, you will make no, in the presence of God, he will make known his paths to you. In the presence of God, all of a sudden there's provision for your life and pleasures. In the presence of God, there's strength and joy that comes back in. If you want to know why you're depleted and you're falling, uh, you know, by the wayside, listen, all it takes is spending some time in God's presence and letting him feel you. Don't say nothing. Just bask in his presence. A lot of times when we're praying for folks, they, they tell us the situation's going on. And as I begin to pray for them, they begin to talk. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's like, stop. Don't say nothing. I don't tell them that, but I want to say that. B because you can't, you can't receive and give at the same time. And whenever we begin to express that, man, we come alive on the inside. So recognize your life right now. If there's no song in your heart, what's going on? Maybe you're just going through a season of stuff. But you know what? Just like you got into it, you can get out of it by God's grace. Amen? Amen. 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 God is faithful for you. What do you do when your spiritual appetite's worn out and the joy you once had is lost? You wake up. What's the second one? Climb out. Climb out. The third one? Drink you drink in. in. The fourth one? Sing you out. sing out. All right, good. Now, I just wanted to share that with you because I love you guys. And it's 10.03. <laughs> and I, my heart is heavy for the body of Christ worldwide. I think we're in a season in our lives right now that we're facing. Uh, I don't know what the future is, and I'm not a prophet. I'm not saying that. But in my spirit... I am very, very challenged saying, hey, you need to be about the Father's business right now. You need to be serious about what God's doing and what I'm doing and, and what your, your part is here on this earth. Because, you know, whenever you're playing baseball, I used to be in a lot of sports, and um, if you don't practice, you know, if you don't, if you don't, if your muscles, you know, we have an MMA fighter here that does some stuff, some trainer, but you guys all know who's played sports, that when the game is on and the ball is hit to you, if you haven't practiced, your, your muscle memories, it's not, it, you're, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. You gotta have repetition, 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 repetition. So that when all of a sudden it happens, man, you just respond and you're, you're moving in the right direction, right? Same thing spiritually. You gotta practice. You know, you know what I call living life on this earth spiritually? It's faith practice. That's what it is. It's faith practice. Challenges come. Life's threatened. Oh, man, Marcus, how do you do that? It's just faith practice. And he's growing and he's wanting to, you know, minister to me and minister through me. And I'm not going to let the enemy discourage me. I'm going to be actively involved in my father's business so that when stuff happens, I'm ready to move with him. I don't want to be left behind. Amen. I want to be right on target in, in God's presence. And that's what I want for you and your household. So, man, stir yourself up. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. 
Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessing.